divine because in perhaps the most important statement in the Old Testament, man was created in the image of God. What an idea! Probably doesn't mean the physical image, but in some sense of what we call a soul, I guess, whatever that is, this inner essence, the life force in us, is something of God in each one of us. All right. I've given you my name. What is your name? How can you ask that question? That question is unanswerable. You cannot reduce God to a name. There used to be a song, which I never quite understood. Goodbye, Ruby Tuesday, who can hang a name on you? And it made me think of this. Who can hang a name on God? God cannot be named. Meister Eckhart, the great mystic, said, you can't put a little red hat on God and stick him under the table. You can't make him what you want him to be. My great-great-great-grandfather, who was a rabbi here on Rutledge Street in the Bristol Home Temple, which is still there, said, you can't grab God by the beard. In other words, we can't make God what we want him to be. The people who wanted to build the Tower of Babel came to no good end. They wanted to take heaven by storm. When God's ready, he comes to us. He, this is a God who comes down. We don't go up, he comes down. Well, if you can name it, remember in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tradition, when God said to Adam, you can name the animals, Adam became a co-creator of the animals. To name something is to invoke the reality, which is why the Jews will not say that name of God, Y-A-H-W-E-H. We're all right never to utter it, it's too holy. We say Adonai instead, which means my Lord. And every time you see Lord here in the Bible, that's that name, yud heh vav -Hey in Hebrew letters. But it's, uh, it's the unpronounceable name because you can't grab God and define him. A name is a definition and God is undefinable. Tell me your name, how can you ask such a question? But I bless you for asking it. Now, Immanuel Kant, one of the greatest philosophers who ever lived, said it is the nature of the human mind to ask unanswerable questions. For example, he talked about the antinomies of pure reason. Does space have an edge? Does it stop somewhere? Well, if it does, say a gazillion miles away, is the edge of space. Try to picture this. Well, what is there six inches beyond? Well, nothing, because space has ended. I can't conceive that. If space has an edge, well, there must be something out here. So I can't say space comes to an end. But I also can't say it's infinite, because I can't conceive of the infinity of anything. My mind is not capable of either considering that space has an edge or that space goes on indefinitely. I can't grasp either one, and yet I ask the question, what about time? Does time have a beginning or an end? Was there ever a time when there was no time? Notice the contradiction in the question. Well, no, time must have no beginning or end, but can I, do I know what the heck I'm talking about? No. And yet I ask the question. So it is the nature of the human mind. Pussycats don't ask questions like that. All they care about is getting salmon for dinner. Dogs don't ask questions like that. They want their next meal too or to go for a walk. Only we ask about ultimacy in spatial terms, in temporal terms, and of God. And there's no answer. How can we ask such a question? And yet we're blessed for asking it. That's what makes being human so exciting to ask these ultimate questions which no one has ever been able to answer, nor can they. There is no answer to the best questions. Only trivial questions have an answer. When is dinner? How big is this room? Is my car parked out there? Trivial. Unless someone has taken it away, that's not so true. So it's, it's all trivial. We concern ourselves with such trivia. And some people, yesterday in synagogue, where I spent the whole day, the Day of Atonement, repairing, repenting my sins, and it talked about who will live and who will die in this coming year. 
Who will be disturbed by a breeze? And who will be steadfast in the middle of a storm? There's some people in the middle of a hurricane, and that can mean any disaster in life, they are firm and you can rely on them. And there are other people who are always going, ooh, ooh, it's, it's, it's too cold, it's too hot, I don't like my chair, blah, blah. They're constantly disturbed by trivia. And it never occurs to them there's a higher dimension. If you ask the questions of meaning, the ultimate questions, which means you're wrestling with God with ultimacy, you're blessed. The worst thing in the world is not to believe anything's important. And I know a number of people who don't believe anything's important. They live on the surface of life and nothing really matters to them. They can't tell the difference between what's crucial and what isn't. That's why it's so infuriating when you say to the waitress, is the fish good? It's awesome. The fish is awesome. What about the cosmos? What about God? And I tell them. And uh, they don't know what I'm talking about because language has been so degraded. In some new prayer books, the word awe and awesome isn't used anymore because it's been so degraded. They did awesome for about two years. Now it's perfect. Someone says, are you coming at six o'clock? And you say, yes, perfect. And I, and I have to, it's not perfect. God is perfect. Coming at six o'clock is desirable. It's not perfect. It's very annoying. Inflation of language, it doesn't mean anything anymore. If words don't mean anything, nothing means anything. How can you ask my name? But I bless you for having asked the unanswerable question. So Jacob called the name. Now Jacob begins to impose meaning on the situation. The other he's wrestling with won't talk, won't give him a clear answer. Well, Kant said to make room for faith. But Jacob, then he acts as an act of faith. I call this place, this world, the face of God. That's what Pene Eel means, literally in Hebrew. Eel is God, Pene Eel, Punim, faith. Why does he call the world the face of God? For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. They believe that if you see God, you would die. God was so awesome, really, oh, he's awesome, not the fish. He would die, you dropped dead. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, once a year, that 30-foot square dark room with the Ark of the Covenant and the two great golden statues of cherubim on either side, he would crawl in there to repent the sins of Israel, and he had a gold chain around his ankle. In case he died in the presence of God, they could pull him out without anyone else going into the holy place. And that was what was believed. And if you see God and you don't die, it's a special act of grace from God. I have seen God face to face. He concludes, it's not only myself, it's not only another man I've wrestled with, it's God. Well, maybe the depth dimension of the human self is God. Maybe the depth dimension of every person, the man, all men, is God. Maybe that's what he's saying. But I say this was a confrontation with God. And the sun, the minute he says that, the sun doesn't just rise, it rises upon him. The light of understanding. The whole world now exists for his sake. He sees God, if the world is the face of God, he'll see God in every blade of grass, in every bush, in every human encounter. And if we really believe that, we talk to people differently and talk about people differently. If we really believe that. That's our great sin. We have friends, people we care for, but when they're not around, we talk with, with friend A against friend B. We say awful things. Then we're with friend B, we'll talk against friend A. That gossip, and it's malicious, it's awful. My resolution for the Jewish New Year is to stop it because it's a major sin of mine. I'm going to try not to do it anymore. The sun rose upon him, the sun of understanding, of insight, the light. Light always symbolizes God in the Bible. As he passed over the world, which is now the face of God, Peneel, 
limping because of his thigh. Now, everything changes in this story. This is a life-changing confrontation with God. Number one, Jacob changes. He is now Israel, God wrestler. He comes to understand himself in a way he never, never dreamed. He's a new man. Number two, his body has changed. Now he will limp for the rest of his life to symbolize his dependence on God and all humans' dependence on God. The world has changed. It is now called the face of God. And wherever we look, we will find God. If you look with the eye of faith, you do find God in the world. But you have to look the right, the right way. That's why so often in the Bible, it says someone's coming toward, say, Abraham. And Abraham lifted his eyes, and he saw. You have, it's how we see it. If we don't see it, in the New Testament, Jesus passed on the power to heal the sick to the disciples. Peter, and I think it's John, are going up to the temple in Jerusalem in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. And there's a cripple sitting there who has his arm out for money. And Peter looks at him. And the first thing he says is, look at me. Fix your eyes on mine. He's about to do a miracle of healing, but he can't do it unless the man is cooperating and involved and believes. And then he says, I have no silver and I have no gold, but what I have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And he pulls him up. And the man not only walks, but he begins to dance around and rejoice and give God the glory. But if he hadn't looked at Peter and their eyes had not met, if he had not been willing to be healed, it wouldn't have worked. Even if Jesus it says he went to his hometown, everybody says, who does he think he is? We remember him when he was a kid running around here in diapers. Uh, he could do no mighty works there without faith. In most of the Gospels, you have to have faith first, and then God will do his mighty works. Not in John. In the Gospel of John, he does the miracles in order to engender faith in people. It's different. But different authors have different views. All right. Limping because of his thigh. So Jacob's body is forever changed. The world is forever changed. He'll now see it as the face of God and act very differently. But miracle of miracles, God is changed. Because the name Israel involves the name God. Isra means, or in Hebrew, Yisra, means wrestling, wrestler. El, E-L, is one of the names of God. If the true human being is the God wrestler, and what do I mean by? I mean a person who wrestles with the ultimate questions of meaning, who isn't troubled by every breeze, who isn't struggling only with trivia, and unimportant things, who has his mind fixed on what is important, the questions of meaning and what life is all about. Such a person is a God wrestler. And he's changed. He's not like the people who are overwhelmed by trivia. He's, he lives on a higher level because he's, he, to him the important questions are the ethical questions, the moral questions, the spiritual questions. How do I stand with my fellow human beings? How do I stand before God? Those are the great questions, not the trivia of life. When the tragedy happened at Mother Emanuel, we were shaken out of our blissful Charleston summer, and we saw those people making acts of forgiveness the next day. And somehow, if you saw that and you took seriously what they were doing, it elevates the soul. I mean, transcending the trivia of daily life is one thing. Transcending when your mother is killed, when your child is killed, this is the work of God. To reach beyond it and to see something higher and not to be dragged down by that monster who killed them. That was a lesson for all of us. And that's the kind of person who in a way is fortunate because they know that life means something, that it's about something. It's not just trivia. 
Sometimes it takes a tragedy to teach us that lesson. It took Jacob this encounter. And God, God now ties himself to man, to Israel, Israel. God is now part of the definition of the ultimate human being, who is a God wrestler. You can't say the name of, God, of man, which is Israel, without saying the name of God, which is El. And you can't say the name of God, El, without saying part of the name of man. So God and man penetrate each other in this story. It's not just a, a relationship, it's an interpenetration. That's what the mystical dimension of religion is about. It isn't content with saying, I'm here and God is close to me. The mystic demands more. Oneness with God. And the Bible upholds that by saying we are the earthly images of God. The way I treat humans is the way I treat God, and the way I treat God is the way I treat humans. What a story. And to commemorate this extraordinary encounter, this life-changing encounter where even God is changed, he ties himself to the human, apparently forever. Israelites to this day, part of the kosher diet that I follow, is that I've never, I, and since I became kosher and started following the Jewish dietary laws, I haven't eaten a leg of lamb. Because that's not a kosher cut. Why not? Because you can't eat the leg. Because the other, the angel, the man, whoever it was, God grabbed Jacob and wrenched his leg out of joint and he limped for the rest of his life and to remember how we Israelites got our name, we don't eat that part of the animal. It's a very practical way of constantly reminding us of who we are. We lean on God, not on ourselves. Well, what a powerful story. I don't know of any more powerful. This writer gets in a few lines so much, such richness, it's extraordinary. Chapter 33. Any questions or comments before we move on? Yeah. Yes. You talk about the psychoanalysis that's going on, and, and could this being be taking uh, Jacob back to his primal event of who else asked his name? In other words, now he has to confront the fact that uh, in his relationship with his father, he did not honestly uh, do it. Yes, that's why I say this may be a substitute father in some sense. When my father died, and only then, did I go in search of my cousin Jastro in Baltimore and my cousin George in Abbeville. Why? It's when my dad died. I guess I was looking for substitute fathers. And I really bonded with those people. They're wonderful people. Uh, I think, yes, this may very well be the case. Jacob's encounters with God, both of them, happen after he in some sense loses his natural human father. And now he wants a better one. One that makes greater demands. One that wrestles in the life and death struggle. This is a metaphor for religious life. It's like Jesus in the New Testament say, take your cross daily. Struggle. Or Churchill saying, he went out among the people after the Blitz and London was in ruin, and as he passed, they grabbed onto his coat as if he were the Messiah. Look, he was like a rock, of course, and he was the courage of the English people. And they loved him and venerated him, and he came home and he said to his wife, poor people, they ask, they think I can help them, and all I can promise them is toil, tears, blood, toil, tears, and sweat. And he led them through the war. And ultimately, it was a victory. Then they immediately voted, voted him out of office. Fools. But uh, <laughs> there it is. Uh, Jesus was crucified, and they didn't re-elect Churchill. Nothing, uh, what do they say? Good deeds. No good deed, no good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> Save a country, they push you out of office. Chapter 33. 
Jacob, again, he lifted up his eyes. He's got to see the way he sees. And looked, and behold, Esau was coming. So in some sense, that dream is an anticipation of wrestling with Esau. Coming with 400 men. Oi, they're going to kill me. 400 armed men. So, again, he divided the children among Leah and Rachel. He put the maids aside and everybody, and he get, puts them in a safe place. He's thinking of others. If the world is the face of God, then you have to be ethical and moral. He himself went on before them. He goes alone to meet his brother, now that he's protected his family. Bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. The guilt must be overwhelming, and the fear. But old Esau is so good-natured. He's the Joe Biden of the Bible. And he's always smiling. And Esau ran to meet him. And he embraced him. He forgot this long ago. He's not terribly sharp, but he's also a forgiving person. And he fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Beautiful reconciliation. And when Esau raised his eyes and saw the women and the children, he said, Who are these with you? And Jacob said, Look how he gives God the glory. The children whom God has graciously given me, given your servant. We've slipped from J into E, the northern source, which calls God God rather than Lord. Then the maids drew near and their children and... He, he meets them all, and he said to Esau, I sent you a present a few days ago. Verse 9, Esau says, I have enough. Keep what you have for yourself. You don't have to give me any gifts. In other words, I've forgiven you long ago. You don't have to buy forgiveness from me. And Jacob insists, please, I want to give you this gift in verse 10. And it's sheep and cows and all that. For truly, end of verse 10, to see you, to see your face, Esau, is like seeing the face of God. Now, Peneel, he sees the face of God in everybody and in everything. He understands the truth in the book of Genesis. The face of, of God is stamped upon every human face. That's what Jesus meant in the incident about should we pay taxes to Caesar? They say, Rabbi, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, let me see a coin. And they show him a coin. <coughs> Whose image is on this coin? Caesar's. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and unto God what is God's. Now, that's quoted by everybody, but nobody ever explains it. It only makes sense if you go back to the idea in Genesis that man, that God's image is stamped on us, why Caesar's image is stamped on a coin. Render your own life to God. Live for God. Live with God. Serve God. And give the coin to Caesar. What difference does it make? It's a difference between trivia and what's important. He's contrasting the image of God in humanity and the image of Caesar on the coin. So a very important idea. And he says, to see your face is like seeing the face of God. If we really appreciate the, our loved ones, and the people who are important in our lives, being with them is like seeing the face of God. What could be more joyous than a family Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner or a holiday gathering? Uh, you're, you're surrounded, assuming you can stand your family, you're surrounded <laughs> by people you love and who love you. And it's, uh, I'm looking forward to going to our family Thanksgiving in Washington. I don't know if I have my surgery before that. I probably won't be able to, but... Uh, and I'll miss it, because this is extremely important, to, be, to appreciate our loved ones. And my mother did, never had a daughter. She had two sons. But the, the, the girl who lived across the hall in our apartment house sort of adopted her as her mother. And she kept, and when she got older and got married and had children, she kept calling my mother almost every night. And my mother complained, won't Alana leave me alone? She's at me every minute. And I said, she loves you. Do you know what that's worth? 
Her mother has passed, and so you've become her mother. You should revel in that, that kind of love. It may be a little annoying constantly. I have students who call me, they know I have some health problems. They're constantly calling me and sending me books. I don't want any more books, for God's <laughs> sake. I had 2,000 books and I gave away, oh, something about 1,400 of them. Enough with books, but I know they mean well. They want to give me something they think it's an act of love. And that's very important to appreciate that. Seeing the face of loved ones is like seeing the face of God. All right, you're insisting that I keep the gift you've sent me, Jacob? Okay, I'll, I'll keep it. Good. Sometimes you have to know how to accept a gift. There's nothing more annoying than really shopping for something. I mean, you know Christmas is six months away, but you'll see it in the window, I bet my niece, my nephew, my mother, father, brother, my friend would like that. So you buy it in August and you keep it. That's a good present giver. Not just get everything Christmas Eve, whatever you happen to pick up. And you give it to the person. And if they say, you shouldn't have bothered. Infuriating, you want to strangle them. They should have pre, you have to know how to accept a gift. I don't care whether you like it or not. You say that you do. It's all right to lie to make people happy. Is it really a lie? Well, who cares? The important thing is to be kind. Now, he's concerned, we'll, we'll skip a little bit, with the frailty of his children, with the flocks. He's very concerned for his animals. So he said, I'm, Esau, we're going to go very slowly back home. We can't rush. I've got to take care of these kids and my animals. And finally, in verse 18, Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is the city that Abraham first sojourned in when he came to the promised land. And he buys, for 400 pieces of money, a piece of land. Abraham had bought a piece of land, and now Jacob buys a piece of land. It's important that the world understand what God has already said. He's giving this land to the people of Israel. But unless you buy it, then the world will challenge it. As it turns out, even if you do buy it, they challenge it. Uh, as I mentioned to you, if you had gone into the New York subways or the streets of New York or any city with a large Jewish population in the 1920s and 30s, you would have seen little Jewish boys with blue cans. And on it was the outline of the land of Israel. And they were collecting for the Jewish National Fund. And those nickels and dimes and quarters were pooled and the, Israel, the Jews bought land from absentee Arab landlords who were living in Turkey, and they built cities like Petak Tikva and Rishon Litzion, and they bought the land, they literally bought it. And you would have thought the world, well, most of the world thinks they just took it, and they didn't, they bought it. A lot of it was taken in the war of 1967, but uh, originally it was, it was purchased, and the same idea here. Uh, God's words have to be confirmed by human beings who will accept money for the land. The problem was the absentee landlords sold the land, but the peasants who lived on the land weren't happy with it. That was the problem. It's a terrible problem over there. Maybe insoluble, I don't know. Terrible. Everyone thinks it belongs to them. Actually, it belongs to God. God says, the land is mine, but you can sojourn on it. Jacob goes to the city of Shechem and buys a piece of the land to establish his ownership before human eyes. Chapter 34. Now this is a very bizarre chapter. There are no spiritual lessons here at all. Well, we have nine minutes. Maybe we can go through it quickly because it's not terribly profound. It's just an old story that's very interesting and gives us some understanding of the customs of the time. I usually skip it when I'm teaching Bible, but here I want to really cover everything. The rape of Dina. Dina is the 13th child of Jacob, his only daughter. And we'll just read it through with a few comments. Now Dina, the daughter of Leah, whom she had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. She's going out to play canasta with her girlfriends. And when Shechem, 
the son of Hamor, who is one of the local Canaanite chiefs. Remember, Abraham doesn't own this land. He bought some of it, but it's mainly Canaanites. The prince of the land saw her. He seized her and he raped her and humbled her. Most terrible thing that can happen in the Middle East. Ruined. And his, but then, having raped her in a brutal act, he falls in love with her. <laughs> Isn't that nice? She's still raped. And spoke tenderly to her. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this maiden for my wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled, defiled his daughter, Dina, but his sons were out with the cattle in the field. Jacob's now an old man. He can't do anything. He held his peace until they came home. And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. The sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard of it, and they were indignant and furious. Their sister's been raped. They've got to do something. Because he had wrought folly in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, for such a thing is, ought not to be done, to say the least. But Hamor spoke with the boys, the brothers of Dina, saying, No, this is a case of real love. The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. I pray you, give her to him in marriage. Make marriages with us, not just those two, but intermarry with us Canaanites. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. You shall dwell with us and the land shall be open to you. Dwell and trade in it and get property in it. Well, this would mean the end of the Israelite people if they just assimilate into the general pagan population. Shechem also said to her father, Jacob, and to the brothers, let me find favor in your eyes and whatever you say to me, I will give. You want some money or property? Ask of me ever so much as marriage, present, and gift, and I'll give according to whatever you choose. Just give me the maiden to be my wife. The sons of Jacob answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully. These boys are planning to kill them all. They raped Dina. There's no forgiveness. And they haven't apologized. They say, well, he loves her, so it's all right. It doesn't say what she feels. Is she supposed to marry her own rapist? In the Arab world, you have to. And even, but here, I'd like to know her opinion. I'm sure she's horrified. They answered Shechem and his father Hamor deceitfully because they had defiled their sister Dina. And they said to them, we cannot blend with you and give our sister to you, one who is uncircumcised. Circumcision is the consecration of the body to God. For that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you. They have no intention of consenting. That you will all become as we are. Every male must be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you. They're lying. And we will take your daughters to ourselves. Lies. And we will dwell with you and become one people. All lies. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then 